Debbie, let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're in a series called Jesus' Foundation for the Church. This morning we're going to look at unfailing qualities of Christian living. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there will be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, they shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide us faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, and we ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning about this thing called love. Lord, we've been studying this now for the past few weeks, and we ask that you just speak to us once more as we open up this chapter in 1 Corinthians and look at what love is and what love isn't. And Lord, may we be loving people. May we show the love of Christ in our lives to all those around us. And Lord, if there is somebody here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, if they've never trusted your Son for their salvation and Him alone, I pray that you would especially speak to that heart this morning before it's eternally too late. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, this is the last message on 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, not the last message in this uh, series about Jesus' foundation for the church, but this is the last message on the portion of Scripture here that we've been looking at in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the list of what is love is and what love is not. And as we've seen so far, God's description of love is much different than that of the world, isn't it? I mean, movies, soap operas, and hit songs usually present love as self-satisfying and often sexual and, and sex is a part of love and marriage but that's not the only part sitcoms and talk shows advocate quick fix relationships downplaying long-term commitment and sacrifice you know the, the world rarely defines love as what we give right it's more concerned with what we get that's the world's definition of love. What can I get out of this? But how different is the Lord's view of love than the world's effective view? And as Paul has shown us, God's way of loving lifts people up. It puts others first. It looks more on the bright side of people's lives than on the focusing on the dark side. It encourages the good in others instead of nitpicking the bad. Christ-like love is others-centered. It is committed, committed to serving others. It affirms and it builds up. And Jesus knows that loving others with God's love doesn't come to us naturally. If left to our own devices, we tend to love just as the world does. So what we need is a transformed mind. A mind that thinks as Christ thinks. 
Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. You know, if we all thought the way that Christ thinks, if we all had the mind of Christ, then listen, there wouldn't be any gossiping. There wouldn't be any backbiting. There wouldn't be any petty jealousies. There wouldn't be any divisions. There wouldn't be any pride. If we all had the mind of Christ, our priorities would be in the proper place. We would practice joy. And joy is an acronym for Jesus, others, and you. That's what brings joy. And you can't help practicing joy when you love as Christ loves. But in order for this to happen, we need to have our minds transformed. Romans chapter 12, uh, you can turn there because we're going to be going back there a little bit later in the message. We're going to just read two verses right now, but we'll read the rest of the chapter a little bit later. But Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we see a contrast in verse 2. Being conformed to the world versus being transformed into Christ-likeness. And Paul beseeches us as a friend who has his best interest in mind. And he urges us to consecrate ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Everything we are and have are to be given to God in His service. And in order to be holy and acceptable sacrifice, we need to do th two things. First, we need to refuse to be conformed to this world. Not thinking as the world thinks. Not doing what the world does. Or loving what the world loves. In other words, not living by the world's blueprint. This, this, this worldly system that, that is run by Satan, that leaves out God. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about worldliness. It's not talking about not enjoying the things in this world, as long as they are not against what God loves. And if I could just get this one point across to us this morning we would really begin to see growth in our Christian lives. We would really start to see Christ in our lives. And we would see His direction in everything we do. But in order for you to live by the, not live by the world's blueprints, in order for you to love as Christ loves, you need to be in His Word. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not a verse just for pastors, folks. It's a verse for everyone. We are to study the word. And then we also need to be on our knees if we're going to be like Christ. We need to be, as 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Always be ready to go to God with everything that you having your life going on. And then also you need to be in his house. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And if these things aren't of the utmost importance to you, then you need to let Christ transform your mind. You need to forsake the world's thoughts and ways. Listen, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, okay? Let God remake you so that your whole attitude is changed. To be transformed means to have a deep-seated change take place where we make decisions, where we form opinions, where we shape our perspectives about life and other people. And how are we to be transformed? By the renewing of our minds. Now remember, we're talking about how we can love as Christ loves. And how do we accomplish that goal? By renewing our minds. Now stay with me here. I'm not chasing rabbits, okay? I'm going to get to 1 Corinthians 13. 
I'm just coming in through the back door. In another one of Paul's epistles, he describes the renewing process like this. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things, he says, okay? Last week we saw in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 that love thinketh no evil, all right? The word thinketh means to estimate, to make an inventory, to number. It, it's like a blank ledger where transactions are reported and recorded for proof in easy recall. And love is to keep no ledger of wrongs done. It harbors no grudges. And the word think in Philippians 4, 8 is the same word. But here it's used in the positive. We are to estimate. We are to make inventory. We are to number. We are to keep a ledger where transactions are recorded for proof and easy recall. But we're to keep track of the things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report and of virtue and praise. See, it means we're supposed to keep a ledger of the things that are rightly done. And if we keep this kind of list in our relationships with other people, instead of keeping the negative list, if we thinketh no evil, but thinketh on these things, then people would see the love of Christ in us, and we would have no doubt that our minds are being made new, and we are being transformed. Keep that negative list short. Look at it and forgive it. But then look at the positive list. Keep a ledger of that. Look on those things. It would make a difference in our relationships. Wouldn't it be great to get a note like this from your mate? Roy Croft wrote this. He says, I love you not only for what you are, but for what I am when I am with you. I love you not only for what you have made of yourself, but for what you are making of me. I love you for the part of me that you bring out. I love you for putting your hands in my heaped up heart and passing over all the foolish weak things that I can't help dimly seeing there and for drawing out into the light all the beautiful belongings that no one else had looked quite for long enough to find. I love you because you're helping me to make of the lumber of my life not a tavern but a temple. Out of the works of my every day, not a reproach but a song. Man, I wish I had wrote that. Don't you guys? You know, but we can still write something like that, all right? We can still write something along those lines to those who are closest to us. We can still express the same uh, uh, sentiments in different words when we think of with a transformed mind and think of others first. Listen, we're never more Christ-like than when we love another individual unconditionally. Just as the Jewish cantor and his family showed the Larry Trapp, as we saw last week. A dragon in the KKK, he renounced his life of hatred because of unconditional love that a family showed him when he was no longer able to live out his life without the care that he was, had needed to have because he was going blind and he was dying. And his quote was this, They showed me such love, I couldn't help but to love them back. We're never more Christ-like than when we love another individual unconditionally. Someone once noted this, It is not our relationship with Christ Jesus which counts before the world. It is our resemblance to Him. Let me say that again. It is not our relationship with Christ Jesus which counts before the world. It is our resemblance to Him. It's how we show Christ to the others. Now, the world isn't going to come up to you and ask if you were born again. They're not going to ask you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. They have no idea what a relationship with God is. But when they see what that relationship does to transform your way of living, 
when they see how it transforms your way of thinking, when they see the unconditional love that can only come through the power of God, when they see how it, uh, how it, all this works out, it is then that they take note and ask this. What is it that makes you like you are? Why are you so different from everybody else? And that unconditional love starts right here in this church. And it starts with the love we have for one another. Amen? Again, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We learn that we are to transform our minds into Christ-likeness. And then Paul goes on to explain what that will do with our relationships to, in the church and in the world. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, it says, For I say, though through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the pro uh, proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy and with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to all necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, Rejoice with them that rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much as liveth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, ye shall heap coals of fire on his head. And be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Listen, what this chapter is saying is we're in this together. Amen? I need you and you need me. We need each other. Someone said this once. They said, the reason mountain climbers are tied together is to keep the sane ones from going home. <laughs> think about that. Let me say that again. I think some of you missed it. The reason mountain climbers are tied together is to keep the sane ones from going home. And with a mountain of mercy behind me and a mountain of mission ahead, I need you, my brother. I need you, my sister. I need to be tied to you and you tied to me. We need to keep each other from bolting, amen? Running away in sheer panic and returning to the sanity of unbelief. And sometimes unbelief simply makes more sense, right? Certainly the culture around us does. It means, it, I mean, listen, what I'm saying here is there are many paradoxes in Christianity, right? I mean, dying to live. Does that make sense? No. Not unless you have Christ. Not unless you know what Christ is saying. It's a paradox. Going low to be lifted up. Giving to receive. Putting others first instead of looking out for number one. Loving your enemies. See, these things make no sense to the world. And that's why we need the church. That's why we need to be here together to worship with one another, to encourage one another, to be there for one another, to lift one another up, edify. We need each other. 
and it will keep us tied together and keep us from fleeing back into the world. And with the love of Christ transforming our way of thinking, with the love that we have for each other and the love we showed uh, to the world, then listen, this church will make an impact for this community and for the cause of Christ. And we can only make an eternal impact on the world and its people when we walk in the same way of love that Christ did. So how do we show this love? Well, 1 Corinthians 13 finally got back there. Let's review what we've learned about what love is and what love is not. In the first week, we saw that love suffereth long. It means patient. Macrothomia. Macro is long as opposed to micro, which means small or short. Thomeo means thermos or heat. It means long heat. It came to mean a burst of heat as in temper. We have our word short-tempered, but the word here is long-tempered. Then we saw love was kind. This is the attitude of absence of criticism and petty-mindedness, being gracious with others. And you know what? Nobody likes a sharp tongue, do they? I mean, do you, do you really enjoy criticism? You know, somebody says there's such a thing as constructive criticism. I don't know if I believe that. Criticism doesn't, isn't very constructive. All right? Nobody likes to be demeaned. It isn't kind to make someone feel foolish because they didn't say something right or do something quite right. And then love envieth not. Love's not jealous. The zealous is the Greek word, and we get our word zeal from it. It means to burn with envy. Jealousy is the inordinate passion to possess what I have. Envy is the inordinate passion to have what someone else possesses. And then we saw vaunteth not itself. Love doesn't brag. You don't like to be around braggarts. People are always bragging and talking about themselves. And then love's not puffed up. Love's not arrogant. All right? And notice bragging is what we do, but arrogant is who we are. Arrogant is being full of hot air, feeling really important, really significant. And then be, doth not behave itself unseemly. Love does not act unbecoming. And this is in reference to actions that are blunt and crude and make others hurt and blush, lacking tact. Last week we saw love seeketh not our own. True love does not think of self, does not pursue selfish interest. And every believer should pray, Lord, let me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Love does not seek our own. And it's not easily provoked. The word provoke means to have a sharpness of spirit, to exasperate, to stimulate to anger. Love can live with the unpleasantness of others without becoming unpleasant itself, which is essential for church life, considering that even the best churches are filled with imperfect people. Amen? We're all imperfect. True love is not stirred to bitterness or a spirit of anger when injured, whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether in fact or in, ima in imagination. And we've already re uh, reviewed that love thinketh no evil. So, let's see the rest of this list and what love has to say to us. Look at verse 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Christ-like love does not find delight in another's fall, but seeks their good. Okay? A lot of people, oh, they fell. You know, they look at it like, oh, I'm better than them. I would never fall. It finds no satisfaction in sin, regardless of who the sinner may be. One commentator named David Pryor observes this. There is a perverse streak in human nature played on and pandered to by most com uh, communicators, which actually enjoys evil, particularly in others. We can fall into the trap of rejoicing, not in what is good and true, but in the murky and sordid. We find false solace in seeing others fail and fall, presumably because we imagine it gives us more leeway to trifle with sin ourselves. That is the reverse of love, which longs to see others stand and grow, which is saddened and hurts when others are defeated. And love does not lead another person to sin. And listen, young people, single people, 
You need to be wary of the phrase, if you really love me, you will. All right, that kind of manipulation is driven by selfishness, not love. Real love never leads a person to demand sex as proof of devotion. Nor does it seek to drive tele, televangelists to siphon money from naive viewers. All right, Christ-like love denies self-gratification and seeks to serve the highest and best for others. And then it goes on, but rejoiceth in the truth. Rejoices in the truth. Love finds satisfaction in truth. And Jesus is what? He is the truth. Satan is the lie. He's the father of lies. Since Jesus is truth, love rejoices in truth. All wrongdoing and unrighteousness is a result of sin and Satan. And Satan is the opposite of truth and righteousness. So love finds no grounds for rejoicing in anything that is wrong. True love expresses itself in truth. Love and truth go hand in hand. And whenever you find love, you find truth. If you love someone, you're up front with him or her, even if it causes discomfort. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. See, when I love you, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And, and as I've said up here many, many times, if you think it's easy to get up here and to tell you that what you're doing is wrong and sinful, then, then why don't you try coming up here and doing it? It's not easy. It's not fun. I find no pleasure in it. But listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough not to come up here and tickle your ears with what you'd like to hear. But I tell you the truth so you won't be destroyed by sin and so that you can hopefully change and become more Christ-like. Listen, love doesn't play games. Love doesn't compromise. Love doesn't spread gossip. Love doesn't lie. And it certainly doesn't believe that truth is relative. That is, truth is whatever people perceive it to be no truth is absolute all right and there are moral absolutes and the bible is the foundation for truth whether our culture accepts it or not so true love is based on the idea that there are right and wrong ways to treat people and love rejoices in truth and then verse 7 beareth all things all right the word beareth means to cover with silence to endure patiently. Love covers all things which reflect the root meaning of the word to cover or conceal. Now don't misunderstand. All right? Paul wasn't suggesting that love operates with deceit or stealth, like a shady politician. Rather, love overlooks wrong done to them. All right? Whether it's attacked, misunderstood, unappreciated, or betrayed, Love doesn't stop to look at wounds. It keeps on going. And then the, the next one is believeth all things. Verse 7 again. Now this does not mean that love accepts as truth all that is stated. All right, true love does not believe a lie. But love is ready to see the best even if an act is unkind or detrimental. True love avoids undue suspicion. All right, where there's doubt, love weighs the matter thoroughly before passing judgment. It gives the other individual the benefit of the doubt until the full truth can be known. Let's make a little deal. Tell you what. I won't believe the bad things I hear about you if you don't believe the bad things you hear about me. How about that? All right? One of the hardest things to do is to have to endure lies, all right? Hearing lies about you, hearing lies about me, all right? And if you've ever been lied about, then you know how much that it hurts to know that other people are going to believe those lies without finding out the truth, all right? And knowing that some people will not give you the benefit of the doubt until the truth can be made known is hard to endure. And I would hope that if you ever hear anything about me, that you would come to me and find out if it's true or not. And I promise to do the same thing for you. And believe in the Greek means trust. Love is trusting, not suspicious. 
Love takes the kindest view of others in every circumstance as long as it possibly can. Love will consider the motives and make every allowance for failure. And when a man has fallen, love will think about the battle that he must have fought and the struggle that he must have had before he went down. Love gives the benefit of doubt. And then hopeth all things. That's also verse 7. Now what do we usually think about when we hear the word hope? The word usually brings to mind wishful thinking. I hope I win the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. All right? I hope I don't forget Valentine's Day because if I do, I'm dead. Okay? But the biblical idea of hope goes beyond wishful thinking to confident expectation. In the New Testament, hope never indicates a vague or fear, fearful anticipation, but always the expectation of something good. And Paul used the term many times to urge believers to focus on future events, our eternal life. All right, Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The reward of our work for Christ in Hebrews 6, verses 10 and 11. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. And the second coming, just to name a few. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So hope for us as Christians grows from our faith in a God who keeps His word. So what did Paul mean when he said, Loveth, love hopeth all things? That love always believes the best about people? No, more likely he meant that love always believes the best about God's ability to work in people's hearts and lives. You know, how dismal would our churches be if we had no hope that people could change, that we could grow more dependent on Christ, that we could clean up our language or get an upper hand on that bad habit that we have or learn to appreciate our spouse. Love never loses hope. It believes that the potter's hands will shape souls. And then love endureth all things. It endureth all things. Now, love perseveres. It never gives up. It's like a determined soldier. You can shoot at love, deprive it of comfort and recognition, even ambush it, but it will keep on marching long after the events and emotions tell it to stop. Now, does that mean that we let others walk all over us like a welcome mat? Of course not. Just as forgiveness doesn't mean that you let people walk all over you when you forgive them. All right, if we're going to, if we, if you were to forgive someone who abused your children, would that mean you would let them into your home and give them another opportunity to abuse them again? Of course not. You forgive them for your sake, but you still keep them away from your children. The same thing can be said for murder. All right, I've heard of people who have forgiven someone who murdered a loved one of theirs. But that person is still in jail. And the consequences for their action is going to be played out regardless of their forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you stop protecting your family from evil or evil influences inflicted upon you or your family. And it's the same thing in the church. We see this in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, all right, we read of a man, or chapter 5, I should say, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we read about a man who has an incestuous relationship with his mother-in-law. All right, what did Paul say? Oh, just forgive them and let them continue on and everything will be okay. Just, it's okay. Love them. Forgive them. Just let it go. No. He, what did he tell him? He said, Get the guy out of here. Get him out of the church. Get him out of here so his sin doesn't spread. 
We don't want this stuff to spread through the church. Get him out. Until he confesses his wrong. Until he confesses his wrong, have nothing to do with him. Well, that doesn't sound very forgiving and loving. Oh, yeah, it does. It sure certainly does. There's no contradiction here. All right? You can forgive them and you can love them regardless, but that doesn't mean you let them back in to continue to do what they're going to do until they say, I was wrong, they're out. And this man eventually did. He did come back and confess that he was wrong and stopped it, and he was brought back into the church. Okay? So don't believe that forgiveness and love is just letting anybody do whatever they want to you and get away with it. That's not what biblical forgiveness and love is about. When Jesus said to love your enemies, what does that mean? What was he saying? He's saying that we'll have enemies, right? People who don't care for us, people that want to destroy us. All right? We can love our enemies, but that doesn't mean we have to buddy up with them and let them destroy us. No, we choose to just go on and not let them destroy us. That's what it's all about, so they don't destroy us. When we keep focusing on that and focusing on the wrong, focusing on what they're trying to do to us, it doesn't destroy them, it destroys us. So we've got to let it go, forget it, forgive it. Well, you can't forget it, but you forgive it and you move on. But you don't let them continue to destroy. That's not right. All right? See, endureth all things doesn't mean that you let them continue to uh, let them into your life so that, that you can endure their malicious attacks. But it does mean that love keeps going. All right? And then charity never faileth. Verse 8. Charity, love never faileth. All right? Love never ends. Now, unlike prophecy and tongues and knowledge, which will pass away, love will go on forever. It will continue through death into eternity. Why will love last? Because God is eternal and God is love. 1 John 4.16 says, And we have known and believed that the love that God hath to us, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. God's love is eternal. Love's going to outlast everything else. And when we love people with agape love, we tend to be less upset when people treat us badly, such as when the boss gets mad at you for no reason, or your spouse takes you for granted, or your friends exclude you. Why? Because our focus is no longer on ourselves. We're committed to serving and loving God and others regardless of their response, just like Christ did. I like the story of little Chad who is shy and quiet. Kind of unliked by his, the kids in his class. And one day he came home and told his mother that he wanted to make a valentine for everybody in his class. And her heart sank. And she thought, I wish he wouldn't do that because she'd already watched the children as they walked home from school and little Chad was always left behind. Nobody paid attention to him. And they laughed and they hung on to each other, but they ignored him completely. Nevertheless, he persisted and she cooperated and bought the paper, the glue, and the crayons. And for three whole weeks, every night, Chad worked on the stack of 35 valentines for everybody in the class. Valentine's Day came and Chad's mother was discouraged, but Chad was full of excitement. He stacked all the valentines in the paper sack and he bolted out the door with, his, uh, with the valentines under his arms. And his mom thought, I'm going to make him some his, his favorite cookies and have them nice and warm and some milk when he comes home because he's going to be so disappointed. Well, that afternoon, she had the cookies waiting for him and with the milk. And she heard the children outside, and she looked out the window, and sure enough, there they were walking along, and Chad was in the back walking by himself. They were saying nothing to him, and as always, he was trudging home alone, and she fully expected him to burst into tears when he walked inside. So when he got inside, she said, Honey, Mommy has some of your favorite cookies for 
you and a glass of milk waiting for you. And he hardly heard her words. He just marched on by and he said, not a one, not a one. Her heart sank. Then he added, I didn't forget a one. I didn't forget a single one. They all got Valentine's. See, we like Valentine's Day because we get a Valentine. He liked it because it was his chance to love others regardless of their response. And there's something terribly Christ-like about living like that, isn't there? Dying to self because of the love that you have for others. That's just what Jesus did for us on the cross. Romans 5, 7, and 8 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man would some ever even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us so much that He sent His Son to take our place because we're all sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need salvation. We can't save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. You cannot go sinless. <laughs> Period. Nobody can. One sin is enough to damn you to hell. And we've all sinned. We all need Christ's forgiveness. We need to put the tr our trust in Him. Jesus came to this earth, God in flesh. He lived a perfect life that we could never live. He shed His perfect blood which came from His Father that had no sin because we're all blood poisoned by Adam's sin. But He had the blood from His Father so that He could go to the cross and shed that blood because without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sins. Our sins could be washed away by the blood of Christ. And all we have to do is put our faith in Him. He died on the cross. He was buried. And three days later, He arose again. That's the gospel. You don't add anything to it. You don't add baptism. You don't add good works. You don't add church membership, denomination. You don't add anything to it. Because if you add anything, you're saying what Christ did wasn't good enough. And you're not saved. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus my good works. If you're adding anything to it, you negate it. And you're not saved. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus and Him alone. You put your faith and trust in Him. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all the publican had to say. And Jesus said He went down justified. That's easy believism. As opposed to what? Hard believism? Never understood that. It's not hard to be saved. When you repent, you're not promising God that I'm not going to sin anymore. You're not promising God I'm going to turn away from this sin that I've committed. I'm, I'm going to turn away from it. I'm not going to do it anymore. You can't say that. Until you're saved, you can't turn away from it. He has to save you, and then He works on you. And then you can get victory over that sin. But you don't try to get victory and promise God. You can't promise God that. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. Nobody will ever be perfect even after they're saved. Repentance means a change of mind. Just like I'm ex explaining this morning, a change of mind is I'm not going to trust my baptism. I'm not going to trust my denomination. I'm not going to trust my good works. And if you think that that's easy for people to do, you haven't talked to a lot of people. Because that's exactly what they believe is going to save them. And it is hard to get them to change their mind. They're not going to, a lot of them won't change their mind. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to forsake my denomination. I'm not going to, uh-uh. Very hard to get people to repent, to change their mind about how they think they're going to get to heaven. And that's what repentance is. You change your mind. I'm not going to trust any of that. I'm going to trust just what Jesus did for me. And I'm going to accept it. Be merciful to me. That's how much God loves us. Unfathomable. He loves us so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. 
make us a child of his. And if you've not accepted Jesus Christ, my prayer for you is that you will trust him. Repent if you think you're still going to get to heaven by those works that I explained. You need to repent of that and turn to him. Because until you do, you are not saved. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not done many wonderful works in your name? Prophesied in your name. Cast out devils in your name. Look at all. And Jesus is going to say that to them, some of them, ah, sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. We need to trust Christ. That's the main thing. Accept the love that he has by sending his son for your sin. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this chapter in 1 Corinthians that we've learned what love is and what love is not. Father, I do pray that you continue to speak to our hearts long after this message and the others have been given. Lord, help us to be loving people. Help us to be loving toward one another. And Father, help us to show the love of Christ to those who so desperately need it which is anybody who doesn't know Christ. And Father, may that love that they see ask us, cause them to ask us of the hope that we have in you. Now, Father, speak to hearts as we give an invitation. May your Holy Spirit move in us. And may we be not hearers of the word, but as we lead, may we be doers of what we've heard. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.